and welcome to The Last Looks Podcast, a show where we catch up with talented hairstylists and makeup artists in the film and television industry. We'll pick their super creative brains and find out all the good stuff. Join me, your host, Jamie Lee, in finding out what's what in the hair and makeup departments around the world. And now, our feature presentation. Today, I'm speaking with prosthetic makeup designer Mark Coolier. Mark is the winner of two Oscars and BAFTAs. Mark's resume is a long list of incredible projects. We will touch on a few in this episode, but I'm sure it will leave you wanting to know more. We chat about his start in the industry, collaborating with so many amazing artists over the years, and what projects he has coming up. Picture up. Last looks. Rolling. And action. Welcome to the Last Looks podcast, Mark. Hi, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I would like you to finish this sentence for me, okay? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> You're like, uh-oh. Now I'm um, <laughs> <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a boy named Mark, and when he grew up, he wanted to be... Ooh, a special effects makeup artist. You did? Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ever since I was about 12 years old, I think. Yeah. So what what did you see that made you think that's a job and I wanna I wanna be in on that action? Well my, my best friend Mark Burns, who we were at school together, I've known him since I was eleven, and he remembers more clearly than I do me saying to him after seeing Jason and the Argonauts that I wanted to do special effects. It wasn't makeup effects at that time, it was special effects. I wanted to make these creatures and monsters that I saw on screen. And that was the film that was out, you know, it was on TV every every Christmas, I think. Yeah. So that's that's my earliest recollection. And then and then the, the you know, it just progressed from there really and started formulating in my later teens really. And what did you start doing to kind of head in that direction? Well, at that time I think it was still, you know, we didn't have the internet. It was we still it was still a difficult subject to do any research on. So I just decided I loved drawing so I, I decided to just go to art school and, and study drawing really I didn't never really thought about having a career as a makeup artist at that time you know it was it was okay I'll try and I loved film so I wanted to get into the film industry so I thought okay like concept design or storyboarding or something like that you know so I was I was doing drawing constantly and went to art school so foundation course in Preston and then went and did an illustration course in in Cambridge and then towards the end of my Cambridge course, I started getting really interested in makeup. And it was a few things, really. I mean, a few little pointers when I think throughout my life of little things that you can look back on and think, oh, that was quite, that was quite telling. You know, I really loved that. Or, you know, it was things like The Godfather coming out and, you know, seeing this makeup on Marlon Brando. But it wasn't that. I, I was watching, there's a TV show in England called Film, whatever year it was. So it would be Film 76 or whatever, it, whenever The Godfather came out. And I remember seeing an interview with Marlon Brando and he, he just looked completely different. It was like, wow, that's, that's amazing. I'd seen the godfather or clips from it and then i saw this young guy and it was i started looking into it and you know discovered dick smith and that that was one instance really i'd always loved you know all the old universal horror movies you know you know my dad used to go out on a friday night and he'd come back and this is when i was probably 13, 14, he, I'd go to bed at nine and he'd come back at 11 and there used to be a double bill on TV. You know, it would be Frankenstein meets the Wolfman and Dracula, double bill, you know, and he used to wake me up. Yeah. I, think, I think he was too scared to watch them on his own. So <laughs> he used to come and wake me up and he'd, he'd let me watch them, which was a real treat when you're 13, yeah. 14, you know. Yeah, so That's that was so another cool. sort of, yeah, sort of influential time, I think. And then I think when I was at art school, it just became... I started sculpting things. I started making things three-dimensionally rather than drawing. Uh, and I realized I kind of enjoyed that a bit a bit more than being limited to two dimensions, really. And I was sculpting mm -hmm. with definitely the idea that I wanted to change people's faces. You know, I started sculpting on... I just started sculpting faces and skulls and things like that. And then I discovered the book by Lee Bagan, Techniques of Three-Dimensional Makeup. I don't know if you know it, but it's a really well-known book. And Lee Began, it was the first time I'd seen any kind of process 
you know, because at that time you couldn't find out how to make a rubber nose, for example, you know. And I just went, I, I found it on Cambridge Market and I bought it and took it back to my apartment. And it was just a bit of an eye opener, really. And it was a bit of a, it was absolutely the turning point because I thought, okay, I can actually make this. So it told you how to do it, you know, making a live cast and making a positive and a negative and cutting edges and overflows and all that things, all the things that you need for to make a, a prosthetic piece, you know. Right through to application as well. Yeah, an application as well. Although I tell you, looking back, I think it was a really good thing. The the makeups on it are not actually very good. They're not particularly good, you know, the level of the work. So when you look at that book, you, as a as a student, it it kind of looks achievable. You're looking at it thinking, actually, I I think I could do that, you know. And it it was quite encouraging then. And then right at the end of that book, there's a whole load of black and white photographs with really beautiful makeups done, and most of them, I think, done by Dick Smith. I don't have an entire memory of all of them, but there were some beautiful makeups on there. There was he, he did Anthony Quinn up as Kubla Khan and Hal Holbrook up as uh, Mark Twain. And I remember looking at these photographs mm-hmm. thinking, wow, that looks 100% real. And that was kind of, you know, and it was a real it was a real turning point. I, I, that, that's kind of when I decided that that's what I wanted to do. Really. That's amazing. So uh, did how did you, I always love to ask how, how parents feel about this kind of line of work. Were they just like, uh, are you nuts? <laughs> or did they see it and they were like, yeah do it that's amazing uh, well again they, they were both totally different my father yeah. when i when i was 14 or 15 he asked me what i wanted for my birthday and i said an airbrush and he thought i said a hairbrush and he's a you know northern <laughs> bloody what do you want a bloody airbrush <laughs> he had no idea <laughs> i wanted to be a makeup artist so i had to explain that it was no 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 it's an airbrush because i wanted to paint with it and he was like so my dad didn't get it at all you know he didn't really he wanted me you know my dad's a, a car dealer and i used to work for him in summer painting car you know spraying cars and yeah. doing body body work you know and i think he was expecting me to carry on doing that you know my intentions to go to art school were, were sort of probably frowned upon at that time but my mum was really encouraging my mum was the yeah. more artistic one in in the family really and she she was really encouraging you know and supported me all the way through it really that's probably an exciting thing for someone to hear that your kid wants to get into something so different yeah i don't think either of them really understood it you know that i yeah. wanted to make monsters you know it just don't seem like a, a viable job i think if you said that to your parents today it would be more acceptable because you could type it in on Google and go, okay, how do I go about making monsters for films? You know, and you'd get yeah. some good answers, you know, and you'd find out how to do it. At that time, it was just like, oh, really? Oh, really? Is that what you want to do? Okay, leave you to it. Once you've figured that out and you've found the book and you've had to play around with everything yourself, how then do you make that happen? Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. That's diff- with difficulty <laughs> then, it was so hard. Yeah. I mean, I have so much admiration for all the guys who went before because – you know, comparatively, I had it mm. easy, but it was incredibly difficult then to find out anything. You know, you know. So we, and I, I know all the all my contemporaries really, the guys who started off at the same time as me, like Neil Gordon and Paul Jones and Paul Spiteri, were ended up working at Image Animation, a, a company in the UK that was doing all that stuff at the time. But yes, mm. it was incredibly difficult. So what I decided to do was I wanted to go and learn the basics. You know, I'd, I'd seen in these books, you know, laying beards. Checked out the Richard Corson book from the mm-hmm. library. And I started laying beards on myself and doing old age stipple with latex and all those. And I wanted to learn all the early techniques, you know, the, the sort of nose putty noses, and, you know. So I, mm-hmm. I, I went to the London College of Fashion to do a theatrical makeup studies to learn a bit of hairdressing and styling and beard laying and corrective makeup and fashion makeup and all that stuff and it it really awesome. it, it covered everything at that time it was a really great course mm. and I'm so glad I did it I only did a year of the two years because at the end of the first year I got offered a job image animation that's, that's the next step in the in the story really but when I was in yeah. Cambridge, I rented a little studio and I started sculpting masks. And I'd read somewhere that you had to build a portfolio up. So I started, you know, sculpting things and taking photographs and trying to get a portfolio together. Uh, one thing that was really helpful at the time, I remember going to Charles Fox because we'd all sort of save up our money and go down to Charles Fox and buy some alginate or some plaster bandage, which cost a fortune. You know, I was a penniless yeah. student at the time. So I remember saving up about 
20 pounds and getting the train down to London and buying a bag of plaster and some alginate and coming back all excited to Cambridge and having some friends of mine take a face cast of me whilst writing instructions on paper in front of them. And and when I was in Charles Fox, I saw a card on, on a on a post-it note thing, you know, somebody's mm-hmm. card, and it was Dave Elsie. And oh, wow. um, so I just, I wrote to him, you know, proper pen and paper in an envelope, you oh. know, and <laughs> sent him this letter saying, sent him a few photographs, a few photographs of what I'd made. And he was really encouraging and it was great. We ended up having a conversation with a local phone box and, you know, me and, me and Dave had a conversation. He, he'd just done a traineeship on, well, actually, I think he was properly employed by then on, on uh, uh, Little Shop of Horrors, which oh, wow. was headed up by Lal Conway. And then he was oh. about to start work on Hellraiser. And, and it was great. You know, Dave sent me photographs of what he was doing and I sent him photographs of what I was doing, and, you know. When I finished the first year at the London College of Fashion, I was asked by this girl in the second year. She she'd been asked to do some hair punching on a werewolf suit, and I think okay. she got she got a bit scared by it. So she said mm. she didn't want to do it anymore, and she wanted to know if I wanted to do it. So I'd, I'd done a little bit of hair punching myself, so a tiny bit, you know, but not much. So I mm. went out to Image Animation, got picked up by Bob Keane at the time, and they were doing a film called Waxwork. And Dave Elsie yeah. was actually sculpting a couple of characters for it, a werewolf and a witch. And so it's the first time I'd actually met him after all these, you know, letters back and forth. We didn't write that that often, but it was a few times back and forth. And it was like, ah, oh, right, you know, it was the first time we met. And, you know, he showed me around the workshop. And then that was like walking through the door into Aladdin's cave, really. And it was, yeah. it was just like, wow, this is where I want to be. You know, had a bunch yeah. of young guys all running around, you know, Bob Keane had bought his first video camera. Video cameras had just come out. So he was like filming everybody, beating each other up with rubber hammers and squirting blood, <laughs> doing all sorts of crazy things. And it was it was total chaos, you know. And I thought, wow, you know, people are getting paid to do this. Neil yeah. Gordon's there doing, doing mechanics on something. And Dave Elsie was uh, painting his, his wheel suit. And I had to go in and hair punch it, not really knowing what I was doing. Yeah, I don't think any of us knew what we were doing at that time. <laughs> it's so cool to have that relationship with Dave to just kind of reach out and be like, hey, we're on the same path. Let's, you know, exchange ideas and our work and all that start kind of stuff and then get to work with him. That's so cool. Yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. It was so nice. Yeah, and, you know, he, he'd he been, you know, he was next with Nigel Booth, who's a friend of mine now. We've been working together on and off over the last 20, 25 years or so. You know, Dave moved over to L.A., I think, you know, so he ended up doing mm-hmm. Wolfman and stuff. So he's been back and forth. But, you know, we, we see each other every now and again, you know, all starting off at the same time. It was good fun. Yeah. So is that you? That's just where it all started. Like you just were off after that. Yeah, that was it. I I left makeup school mainly because I had a conversation with the teacher who was teaching the second prosthetics in the second year. You didn't get to do prosthetics in the first year. You did all Mm. your groundwork and all the rubber noses and the mortician's wax and and ball caps and everything else. But in the second year, you got to progress on to prosthetics. And he he came up to me at the end of the first year and started saying, oh, I'm I'm teaching you. I I hear you're interested in prosthetics. I'm teaching next year. And could you just go through a few things for me? How do you do a life cast? So I, I explained to him, how you do a life cast, you know, and then I, I remember saying to him, you know, then you make your positive mold of your, let's say you're doing a nose. And he said, oh, what's a positive mold? Uh-oh. And then I said, <laughs> you know, then you sculpt it, then you make your negative. And I realized I was actually explaining to the teacher how to do the bloody job, you know. So yeah. I, I thought, why is the point in me going back and being taught by this guy who knows about a hundredth of what I know? Yeah. And I mean, the amount you would have been learning in the workshop and stuff would have been far more than probably what you'd learn in a classroom, oh, right? God, absolutely. Yes. I mean, you know, I realized like, what happened was uh, I'd met Jeff Portas on that waxwork and mm-hmm. I, I really liked Jeff and we got on really well. We're still friends today. And he headed up Hellbound, the sequel to Hellraiser for Bob while Bob Keane was in America. I think he was directing second unit for a, a low budget film called the unholy and mm. neil Gort- neil gorton was doing stuff for it and so a bunch of guys were over in america doing stuff and jeff was over in the uk working for bob but but heading up he headed up hellbound for bob and 
hide me on that really. So I think there was a hiatus of a couple of months till Hellbound started. So I, I got hired on that and that was it really. It was just like, okay, I'm not going back to college. It was, you know, I got, I got a job and I realized I'd learn more in about two weeks than I would in the entire year at college. Uh, absolutely. So was the hair punching that you were doing, did you get to go on set at all at that point or was it not till Hellbound that you actually no, went? That, got- yeah, that, that werewolf hair punching thing, it was mm. a 10-day job. We had very little time to get all this stuff done. I had to punch and hair pretty much. There was a guy called Michael Ward making hair knotting a, a suit uh, mm-hmm. and I had to hair punch the chest and all the face and head and everything else and Dave Elsie's witch character in the same film. Bearing in mind, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I just punched away and I actually did quite a nice job of it. But my bench mm-hmm. was, my bench was, there were so many of us crammed into a tiny little room at Shepson Studios. My bench was uh, a, a dustbin with uh, a, a piece of wood on it. That, that was, that, I'm not joking. That was my bench in this tiny little room with about eight other oh. guys all working yeah. till one o'clock in the morning, you know, oh and they're back in goodness. at eight, you know, and it was like, man, we, they really got their uh, pound of flesh, but I loved every minute of it, you know. Uh, so I didn't go on set with that. That all shot in America. Okay. And then I had my little hiatus, which seemed to last forever because I, I just thought, oh, you know, I've been offered this job. You know, I'll be starting next week. And they kept saying, oh, ring up in a couple of weeks. So I'd ring back two weeks later and it was like, oh, can you ring up in a couple of weeks again? <laughs> so I just, I just hung on and hung on and then finally started on Hellbound, which was, which was just brilliant. And that's when I went on set, you know, I met Steve Painter and myself and Steve Painter started at the same time. And Steve's, you know, he's gone on, he, he's headed up a lot of films and, you know, very successful makeup artist in his own right. And we started together as trainees and we just you know worked on the female Cenobite makeup I think on that and loads of other stuff you know and that's kind of where I learned the very first first bits really first uh, stages really yeah it's amazing so do you remember how you felt like just being on a set for the first time oh yeah I do yeah it was so exciting it was like we'd been given the drill you know like you know don't walk into shot and don't do this and don't do that and so it was a bit Mm. terrifying but, you know, once we got on set, it was great fun, you know. It, it was a good crew and it was low budget, you know, and I still I still feel today that the lower the budget, the more fun you have on set, really. The higher the budget, the yeah. less fun. It's yeah, like, it was true. Such a, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, that's why I still do a lot of low budget films, really. I love them. Yeah, absolutely. So you went on to do three as well, right? Yes. Well, I, I just started working at Image Animation. I was there for about five years so we did anything and everything that that came up we were like a little family really mm-hmm. myself neil gordon and paul spateri and john cormican and jeff porter and you know we did hellbound and then nightbreed came up you know which oh, was yeah. which was a huge project in those times you know even now it's 12 months work so that was the yeah. one that really you know we really started expand we still didn't know a great deal you know really when i look back you know first time we'd done floating off overlapping appliances and but I learned mm-hmm. a lot you know and Clyde Barker was great to work with he's a brilliant artist and so much fun so I got to design a few characters and make the whole body suit and you know we we, we all did a, a, a bunch of crazy stuff you know and we had a lot of creative freedom and a lot of fun you know it was like it, it, we seem to have a lot of time there's so little time these days we, we had a lot of time then, you know. I think I, I did a character called Lylesberg in it on Doug Bradley. He's yeah. the old soothsayer type guy. And mm-hmm. I sculpted about four versions of it before Clive chose one that he liked, you know, which you don't really get a chance to do that these days. So in some of our time scales, you know, it's, it's yeah. always our enemy time. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I'm always like, <laughs> when you're like, is there anything you need? Like, what do you... Just let me time. know. And I'm like, yeah, more time. Could I have more time? <laughs> time or money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They go ahead. Yeah. If, if I'm asking for the world, give me that. <laughs> yes. Well, they're always asking for the world. It doesn't matter how much money or time you've got. They always want yeah, the world. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, 
So that's being able to design through to sculpt it, right through to applying it. So that's very cool, right? I mean, that's right. Yeah, there was no there was no departmentalization in Bob's uh, image animation. That was a great thing at that time, and I still try and keep a bit of that going on uh, today, although it's a bit more difficult. Mm. But we, because nobody knew how to do anything, we had to do everything. You know, it was like yeah. I soldered the you know metal contraption that the female Cenobite has running through her cheek and I, you know, made the tools and Hellraiser 3, we all made the costumes and tools, I, you know, I made Pinhead's tools that were hanging off his belt you know, out of wood and bits of metal that we cut up and so it was like you know, we'd say to Bob Keane, who's making that? And he'd go, uh, well, you are so we'd, we'd have to <laughs> like just work out how to do it and make it, you know from from nothing, because he never had any equipment or materials in the workshop it was terrible. That's so, also uh, yeah. But it was brilliant, yeah, it was absolutely brilliant you know, experience, because we did yeah. do a bit of everything, we moulded all our own stuff so you'd, you'd sculpt it you'd mould it yourself, I think in the end, we got a phone maker in and uh, had somebody make it running phones the whole time, because I think they realised it's better to have the sculptors sculpt and the painters paint, and, and you know get somebody who really knows what they're doing to make the phones because it's you know otherwise you run in the mold like eight times to get one piece out you know yeah, so right. we, yeah. we got a proper mold maker and i'm not saying that any of us were any good at what we were doing but we were all <laughs> just doing it you know we had to there was no choice really. yeah so making it work yeah making it work and making it walk as we used to say because uh, <laughs> that's how bob Keane wrote it because he was uh, dyslexic no disrespect to bob <laughs> but it was a funny phrase we, we'd mac it walk that's awesome. Love it. <laughs> if you say if you say that to any of the guys who worked at Image Don't know. yeah, that's awesome. So I see a little bit as you say that you're doing all sorts of everything. So doing a bit of the animatronic stuff as well was that yeah, something yeah. that you wanted to get into and found yourself doing, or were you just well, kind I of thrown into that side of things as well? Thrown in, but also uh, there was a few, there was a couple of inspirational guys around at that time who to us were like seasoned professionals, you know, who did things properly and were brilliantly talented. And one was Paul Catling and one was Steve Norrington. And Steve, mm-hmm. you know, obviously film director, went on to direct Blade. And at the time he worked at Bob's and he worked at uh, Henson's, you know, he was doing storyteller and they both and, and Paul Catlin is a, is a sort of these days he's a concept designer genius you know he does sculpting and he's a brilliant sculptor and, and they were both fantastic mechanics as well mm. you know they were animatronic you know they'd make their own animatronics so we were all kind of aspiring to be able to do the same thing you know Neil Gorton was was mechanizing a gorilla head that he started when he was about 14 i think neil was you know he was a few years ahead of me at the time but he was mm. you know i think he's five years younger than me so he, he was 19 when he started at bobs and i was 24 you know so i was wow. I, I remember going to the pub once and the, the the oldest guy around the table was 27 you know and i was the mm. second oldest out of 10 guys sat at the table you know and a couple of girls there at the time as well you know there wasn't it was it was you know these days there's was, was more more women in coming into the industry than there are men but at that time it was quite male heavy i think you know we were all yeah. monster fans you know coming into it sorry i've, I've digressed onto the no. question <laughs> i was just talking about the animatronic side of things uh, and, yes yes, and yes. so I, I did that. a I did a mechanical head for a show that Bob was making, and I think I just realized that it's not my cup of tea. I'd love to be able to do it, and I think mm. it's always a desire to want to understand every process that we do, but you realize the more you go on, there's too much to know, really. That, you know, yeah. even just taking hair as a, as a, as a subject, you know, like the, the, the involvement of hairstyling and hairdressing and cutting and mm. putting wigs on and laying beards and, you know, punching eyebrows and oh, there's a million things to know just with hair, you know. And animatronics is just one of those things that you're better off, at some point you just realise you're better off letting the mechanical geniuses get on with it and uh, concentrate on what your what your strengths are, really. So I, I think that's what, and it, it naturally happens in the film industry, I think, when you're working with somebody. You work, mm. you know, when people come and work for me, I naturally give the good sculptors the sculpting work and the good painters the painting work, you know. So it's a yeah. natural thing. I was never a, a great at animatronics, so I ended up not doing it, really. But it, it was yeah. great to do it and realise how bloody difficult it is so that when... You know, I'm getting other people to do it. I have a little bit of an understanding about it, you know. 
Yeah, you can. Um, you have the respect of understanding that. Oh, yeah, that's going to be a tricky, <laughs> tricky situation to work out. Yeah, and the, you know, in that respect, also, there's nothing better than looking at a beautiful animatronic creation that somebody's done that's working with you or for you, and at least having an understanding of the basics. You know how an eye, how an eye mechanism works, and you know, I can have some detailed discussions with animatronic designers and say, oh, what if we did this? Or I once saw this and how it was linked up and cabled and everything else can't do it myself but i can sort of you know ask the question same with mold making really i've done a lot of mold making but i'm not the best mold maker on the planet but i have a very detailed knowledge of mold making and breaking down prosthetic appliances and i'm the one that usually people ask how should i do this and how should i do that and i can point them in the right direction you know so so from the beginnings that you had of being thrown into all sorts of areas i guess it definitely helps now in the position that you are when you've got people working under you to have more understanding about what everybody's doing and what they need to do yeah definitely yeah yeah, and uh, you know that's right across the board. Really, the more knowledge you have, uh, the better. Really, so it's still learning every day. You know, still doing stuff and still coming up with new things. And everything changes, and new techniques and materials come in. So you still have to be on your toes. You know, and going off what you're just saying right now, is there something that you've learnt recently that's new that kind of got you excited? Yes, yes, definitely. We just bought uh, a scanner, a handheld scanner, for the workshop because we've been scanning our actors recently we we've had some Mm. actors on pinocchio we wanted to scan the little boy i did matteo garoni's pinocchio we wanted to get some you know we wanted to get a a perfect replication of him so we we had him scanned rather than life cast i think we did a life cast as well but we had him scanned so that there's no distortion on the on the facial shape and we had a guy who was playing the gorilla called teco celio and he was very sort of in his 60s and a, a little bit sort of, you know, twitchy and uncomfortable. And somebody had tried to do a life cast for him and it, mm-hmm. it came back and it, they couldn't get a life cast off him properly, really, because he was moving about too much. So we had him scanned photogrammetry. So, you know, you only have to keep still for a second as the shutters go off and on the mm-hmm. cameras, you know. And we got this really great head cast back so we just basically started you know scanning actors rather than trusting a life cast you know and you get a more more accurate look you know you, the skin texture is not as good but it's almost All as right. good now and the scanners have come down in price so that we're able to afford it now and we we've just done some great things with it i've got a guy called adam edwards who's who's been doing a lot of the stuff and he's uh, a sort of mold making and technical and sculpting you know he's just an all-round good guy you know he does a bit of everything and uh, he's been working on this and we've been scanning all sorts of stuff and then coming up with ideas for how we can use it you know we just did a job for a friend of mine and it was a body lying down so we had a choice of either you know life casting the actor laid down on a table and or we could scan him you know so we we laid him on the floor and we scanned him and we had it cnc'd out in in a blue foam it was being closed so we didn't any detailed bits needed were the head and hands and we got this perfect lying down shape you know that normally we'd be getting a body we'd either life cast him but then there wasn't much money to make it so we'd be mm-hmm. we'd be getting a polyfoam out of a body out of a standing body and right. we'd be cut we'd be cutting that up and we'd be fabricating it into the correct shape and you know it's just difficult it's a difficult thing to do it takes a few weeks you know and in a week we had the whole body down it was molded in a few days and we made a foam out and we had this beautiful looking lying down body you know so it's a good workflow i'm not i'm not into sort of trying to what people think, reinvent the wheel and you know in terms of okay if 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 clay and molding something practically and you know traditionally is the best way to do it then i'll do it that way you know but there are certain mm. things that scanning and scanning and printing and 3d printing are, are really useful for there was another one we did a live cast of an actor recently and when we got the live cast out it was it was really good apart from the lip was just slightly out and we had to scrub this mm. makeup on it so we'd scanned him as well so we we 3d printed the the, the the nose, lip and chin area just to get it out and have a look at it next to the live cast. And it was different. It was algae, uh, the silicon material that distorted the lower lip quite a bit. So we right. basically 
we chiseled it all out of the plaster life cast and dropped in our 3D printed bit, you know. So I do think actually, you know, sculpting prosthetics on a on a scan and a 3D print is is better all around. So yeah, that's that's the new toy. Can you tell I'm excited about cool. it? That's very cool. So <laughs> when you when you when you scan, so talk me through this. So you scan somebody and then it gets 3D printed, and it's what material is it being printed into? Like a plastic? Yeah, well, you know, you can either, for the body, we sent that off to a CNC machine. So they mill it out with one of their sort of six axis CNC machines. You know, so that's like a, a drill that cuts into foam, like a router, you know, that, that cuts into okay. foam. And then if we are doing a head, we would print it out in a plastic, yeah, resin. And there's various ways of doing that. Some are an extruded plastic line that's heated up and like a hot glue gun almost that moves around yeah. and builds up builds up layers that's an fdm printer and then there's one that we've just bought which is a tank of resin that's uv activated so it activates each layer separately and builds up the model that way so oh, and it's, wow. it's very good it's brilliant you know for the, yeah. the the price of all these things that has come down so much and the size of them is now you know to the point where you can actually 3D print a head, you know, and it will come out, you'll get it out in two days rather than wait 10 days, you know. That's cool. So that's the difficult thing. It's the, it's the time. It's the time it's it the takes time. to print yeah. everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Going back to that. then sculpting on top of that kind of material, is it, does it feel any different? Well, we would we would mold it and get a plaster out and sculpt on the plaster. You know, that's still the, do that. Like, okay, we, we'd still we'd still sculpt on the plaster. Yeah. I know there's a few okay. people out there who've been you know they're sculpting in dead brush from print. You know that you can 3D print the negative molds and make a prosthetic piece out of the positive and negative. And you know, I'm I'm looking at that, but it's that's not going to change until for me it becomes quicker or more cost effective to do it that way. You know. If you can yeah, do it, definitely. if you can do it with plaster and clay in two days, mm. and it takes you six days to do it, and then brush on the computer, and you end up with the same product, then I would choose the traditional way for sure. Yeah, of course, yeah. and still yeah. getting your hands in there. There's another thing with with body scanning and casting is, is the process of the what the actor has to go through. You know, they mm. either stand there for ten minutes in a tight fitting garments, or or they've got a three hour you know prep and body cast and it's uncomfortable and dirty and they've got a shower afterwards and all that kind of stuff you know so scanning and uh, a body and printing that out is a, is a no-brainer really even if it costs a little bit more it's for the actor's comfort really and the accuracy accuracy of the product at the end of it you know you can get the perfect body position that you want you know yeah, it's very cool. I mean, I can imagine back when you guys were first starting in that workshop, if someone came in and said that in the future you were going to get to scan somebody and then print them out, you would have been like, what? I know, I know. It's <laughs> phenomenal, actually. And I, I think back to the, the the first time I saw Adobe Photoshop was when I, on a visit to Henson's and mm. Quentin Plant, there was a guy called Quentin Plant who was their computer guy, and they just bought a scanner and – Photoshop, and I think the scanner was about two thousand pounds. I'm going back about twenty years, mm. and you know, and they had Photoshop, and and they scanned in it. You know, they said, "Oh, look at this," and they put a photograph, and they scanned the photograph, and it came up on the computer, and then they cut somebody's head off and pasted it onto something else, and I was just blown away. It was just, it was amazing, you know. And I I went out and bought Photoshop, and I got myself a laptop and started using Photoshop and designed. You know, we we always did the drawings on acetate and laying layers over onto a photograph, you know. So you're, wow. you're limited by trying to paint onto a plastic film, you know. And it was yeah. it was horrible. It was a horrible way to design makeups. And suddenly you're on the computer and you can you can draw hair on someone's face or you know, and I remember doing the first designs I did in Photoshop were on of Sam Neill's character on Event Horizon. And I did a lot of the Photoshop designs and the director loved it. And we're going back quite a long time, you know, 15 years ago. Yeah. Or so I was working for um, animated, a company called Animated Extras at that point. So, yeah, the 3D printing thing and the scanning and everything else is really mind-bending to have it there in the workshop. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Leaps and bounds. My goodness, what's going to happen in another 20 years? <laughs> well, exactly, yeah. We won't be here. <laughs> Who knows? Hey, I want to go backwards for a little bit and say yeah. that I spoke with Lois Burwell because oh, yeah. I saw that you did Highlander 2 and she did the first Highlander and I know that that was quite 
quite a challenge, the first one. I was just wondering if the second Highlander was as much of a challenge or was it a easy breezy show to work on? Ooh, Highlander 2. Yeah, I forgot the lovely Lois did the first one. Yeah, she, she, <laughs> yeah Highlander 2. It was brilliant. It was such a great film to do. Again, Jeff Portas headed it up. And mm-hmm. myself and Paul Jones and Jeff, we built a load of stuff in the workshop. And then we flew over to Argentina, to Buenos Aires, for three months. And oh, wow. we didn't have a great deal to prep. It was just brilliant. You know, we just went there and we went into the workshop every day and we potted about and we did our makeups. And it was the most sublime job. You know, we got it wasn't like a total nightmare panic. It was lovely. And Christoph Lombert at the time was, was you know, he was a huge celebrity at the time, you know, so he, he would go out and arrange nights out, book out restaurants and nightclubs, and we, we had a great time. It was so brilliant. Good to hear. It was really cool, <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, we, we, we had these assassin makeups to do and various sort of decapitations and things like that, and it was just great fun. Yeah, it was amazing. I'd love to go back to I've never, I never got the chance to go back to Buenos Aires, but yeah, very fond memories of that trip. That's very cool. I just remember Lois saying that. I think by the time they were finished shooting, I think there were only like two or three original crew members left. So oh, many right. people had like quit and just gone, I can't deal with this anymore. And just, yeah, and she was one of one of the people who hung on to the to the bitter end so I'm glad that the second one was a lot more fun yeah I think you know the fun, I guess the truth is we weren't on set every day doing the day-to-day mm-hmm. grind you know we yeah. were me myself Jeff and Paul were on set just when the assassin characters were on or just when one of our decapitation gags was on so we didn't we didn't get the full brunt of you know the early mornings and the the horrors of filming you know so my memory of it was was a really good one that's awesome. Hey, now I do need to talk about the Harry Potter films with you because oh, yeah. how incredible was that whole situation? I mean, when you first became involved in that, did you have any idea it was going to gain the momentum that it did? No, we had no idea. I'd been working for Nick Dubman on and off uh, for a few mm-hmm. years. I was just freelancing around, but I had my own company at the time, which I started in 1998. And I had my daughter, Isabel, my first daughter, my first child. And, you know, running a company and having a small child who was waking me up every two hours during the night was a nightmare. Mm. And I remember Nick ringing up and saying, hey, Mark, do you want to come and I'm doing The Mummy. Do you want to come and work on The Mummy? Mm. Or maybe it was the second one, The Mummy Return, I think it was. So I decided to stop my company stuff and go and work and freelance for Nick just for a bit of breathing space, really, so I could just go in. And I I always loved working for Nick, so I worked for Nick for a long time. And then after The Mummy Returns, he he was talking about this film, Harry Potter, and he said, oh, you know, it's the next thing that he's moving on to. And he managed to get the film and said, oh, do you fancy doing that as well? So I was still, you know, my daughter was still only about six months old and not sleeping during the night and all that stuff. So I decided, yeah, I'll, I'll just carry on and just, ended up where you know it just went on from project to project really so yeah yeah, i ended up working for nick on that i still had my own stuff going on in Mm. between so i'd finished one film and then for example we i did sunshine the danny boyle film for my for my own company so i did that in between the harry potter stuff you know but nick was always very happy to just get me back and you know just offer me the job and if it if it fitted in then, then yeah, I'd, I'd do it. You know, some of them were, some of the Potter films, I was on it for three months and some of it I was on for 12 months, you know, depending on the size of the project, really. Yeah, that's awesome to just be able to kind of come in and out and in and out. I think it, I don't know, I think sometimes it can just make it a little bit more enjoyable, can't it? Yeah, well, some people thought I was crazy at the time to go back to freelancing <laughs> after making the step to yeah. form my own company, you know, but for me, Nick always, you know, I have a great, re- we have a great relationship and I I always had a great relationship with Nick. So he, he was very cool about it. You know, he just said, oh, it doesn't make any difference. Just come and work on the film. And then when you finish, just carry on, you know, it's very um, savvy in that way. And I didn't mm. think, you know, I just thought I'll do whatever I'm enjoying, really. If I'm having fun doing it, yeah. then that's, you know, and it's six months work. A, financially, it's really good. And B, you know, it was with a really talented bunch of people, you know, it was like 
just the most talented people around at the time, you know, and, and a lot of my friends. Yeah. But it was great. Each project had its own challenges, you know. I think it was only later on when we'd been there for six or seven years or something, and it was just like, oh, God, not another Harry Potter, you know. It was like, <laughs> when are they going to stop Voldemort, making them? Not Voldemort again, but Voldemort became my baby, really. So it was just like, yeah. oh, God, I, I can't let anyone go and do Voldemort. I've got to do the last two films, you know. It was like, and, <laughs> I've got to see it through. Yeah, I've got to see it through, and I'm glad I did, you know, absolutely so glad I did, you know, because it was so rewarding. And, and like I said, we, we had such a great time. Nick was a great person to work for. He gave us a lot of artistic freedom and, um, you know, we worked hard and we made some nice stuff, I think. That's awesome. So as far as characters that you looked after, what were the more challenging or enjoyable ones? Well, Voldemort was the sort of hard one in terms of designing the character and getting him you know there were several boxes to tick he had to, you know it was going to be a pg-13 so he couldn't be mm. too scary you know you've got this amazing actor ray finds underneath it so it's still got to look like ray so it was really honing down on that really and try and find something that was creepy and scary to children but not too scary and then it's got to be passed by Warner Brothers and also by J.K. Rowling and by Ray, yeah. you know. So it's a lot of a lot of boxes to tick, really. So that was a hard thing. And and you know, the artist I mentioned earlier, Paul Catlin, was instrumental in designing that character. The early drawings were, all came down from from Paul. So you know, the basic look at it was designed by uh, Paul Catlin, with a lot of, of influence from from our team and from myself. And you know, the final look of it was a, a collaboration, really. But yeah, Paul was instrumental in it. Absolutely. And is that is is it working with VFX with that character? Or is that all practical makeup? I mean, because his... no, it's VFX is the is the nose area, and and we did. It was very simple makeup in the end. It was it was complicated in the sense that you know we had to do it in two hours i think and there was a lot of elements to it and we had a lattice work of veins all over his head rafe thankfully agreed to shave his head for the whole thing so he shaved his head so we didn't have to put a ball cap on right. but we had to cover it cover up their the hairline we had little gelatin eyebrow appliances to cover up his eyebrows and mm. a lot of paint work on his face and then the, i i came up with the idea of doing tattoo transfers for uh, the vein work. So we um, built up this really complicated system of tattoo transferring all the all, all, all the transfers on. And, you know, Rafe's an utter perfectionist, so they couldn't be a millimeter out. You know, they had to be perfect. Mm-hmm. So we used the tracking markers as little... Mar- if we put the tracking markers on the same place every day, then we yeah. could cut our tattoo transfers to hit the tracking markers so we yeah. knew that the tattoo transfers were in the exactly the right place. So if you hit the hit the tracking markers in two or three points, then yeah. you know. So every day we had a little vac form shell that we put over Rafe's face. We marked the tracking markers, so we got the tracking markers in the same place every mm. day. And then we used the tracking markers as points to put the tattoo transfers on. So it was all you know millimeter perfect. I can understand why you didn't want to, um, that you wanted to hold on to that puzzle because what a thing to hand over to somebody else. Yeah, yeah. I mean, part of me would have loved to. But, you know, I was working with, you know, Duncan Jarman and Stephen Murphy as well, you know, two really good friends of mine who were yeah. helping me do the makeup. And we had a bit of a rapport and we had, you know, with Rafe and we got on quite well. And it was a tough makeup to do, but it was it was also, I think all three of us are really proud of it, you know. That's awesome. I think we did it about 70 times in total something like that oh I'm sure that's amazing now I want you to talk me through the design process for something like the Iron Lady where do you start with a transformation like that turning Meryl Streep into Margaret Thatcher yeah so I think it's you know we all start just by really just looking at the life cast you know you can just sit with the life cast at your table and photographic reference and work out try and work out what what you need to do i think that was quite difficult because you know it was such a high pressure job and we we had very little access to meryl at the time you know i think we had you know one fitting with the life cast was done by louis zakarian over in new york and so we got sent the life cast so we'd never we'd never i think I, i met meryl very early on in a sort of an interview kind of meeting, you know, where we discussed stuff and she just basically wanted to sound us out, I think, really. Then we got the head cast over and the company that I'd worked for, Animated Extras, we were both given a, a small amount of money to come up with a test. And we we were both, we both did a makeup test on Marilyn. I ended up 
getting the job for whatever reason. And I had Barry Gow working for me. Uh, I think I started Barry off, like I just said, you know, he's a brilliant sculptor. He's the guy who's now been running his own workshop and doing Game of Thrones and has mm. more Emmys than... than <laughs> he knows what to do can, with. <laughs> you, you can count <laughs> yeah. he's Mr. Emmy. And he, he was, I just said, I just thought, you know, this guy's a brilliant sculptor. Just leave him alone and let him sculpt. Mm. I said, there you go. There's Meryl Streep's head and, you know, some reference. And obviously he just went away and started sculpting it. And mm. I always like to do that, you know, for somebody who's sculpting, leave them alone for a few days because it takes a while. I'm, I'm like that myself when I'm sculpting, you know, when yeah. I used to work for Nick, you know, you, you need a bit of breathing space and mm. you need to have the ability to, to mess it up as well, you know, and start yeah. again or throw it in the bin or do three at the same time. And I'll always encourage anybody doing that kind of thing, you know. So after Barry had sculpted this thing, it, it looked like Margaret Thatcher, but there was not enough of Meryl Streep in there, really. So I think it was then just pairing it back. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I guess there's always little nuggets of information that you take from people that you work with over the years. You know, I worked for Daniel Parker on Animated Extras and he headed up Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and did the De Niro makeup and other other things. You know, he's a very successful uh, makeup designer. And I worked yeah. for Dan for, for, for a few years. And he always said, you know, he was always one that was less is more. He was always of the opinion that less is more. You know, if you can do it with straight makeup, then do it with straight makeup. You don't need So yeah. only use prosthetics where you really need them, you know. And mm. I think I took that on board quite a lot, I think. So I, I'll try, I always try and keep it as minimal as possible to achieve the maximum possible you know if you're doing a fat makeup and you're trying to make somebody fat you've got to cover everything you, that, that gets fat you know so that's yeah. different but when you're doing something like the iron lady you've just got to find the essence of it so really it was okay the other thing was the wig and the costume would get us a lot of the way there and i knew that obviously meryl streep's performance would be brilliant yeah. so then it's like okay so we don't have to try too hard to try and get her to look like Thatcher, you know, the wig, the costume, and the other mm. bits that we do, that our, our stuff is really an enhancements to the wig and costume rather than the other way around, you know, in, right. in that respect. That's the way I kind of approached it, you know. Uh. So with the younger stage, it was just getting that center nose piece, really, you know. She's got a little gelatin nose piece on in the center of her brow. And a lot of people can watch that and don't even know what we've done to it so which i think is is good you know i think if you don't if you're looking at a makeup and you're not quite sure what what somebody's done to achieve the effect then it, it's really successful that, those are the best makeups for me it's like i'm looking at them and thinking what the hell have they done have they got pieces on there or is that just straight yeah. makeup or and that's that's when it's confusing that's when it's really good i think and yeah, I, think I mean, you're winning, aren't you? You're completely yeah, falling. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And uh, Meryl said one thing which was really brilliant. And uh, she said, she came in one day and she said that there was a picture released and it went on every broadsheet in the UK of her mm -hmm. in her makeup. You know, they very cleverly released a picture before the paparazzi got their hands on it. And so they got a good picture out and it, it was used in all the papers. You know, it was on the Times and the Telegraph and in the UK. Mm -hmm. And Meryl was really happy the next day. She came into the work. We were still filming at that time. And she said, it's really brilliant. Nobody's mentioned the nose. <laughs> so she was really pleased that nobody, nobody had even said, oh, look, it's Meryl, which is yeah. exactly what we didn't want. You know, we didn't want somebody to go, oh, look, look, look what they've done to Meryl Streep's nose, you know, because yeah. then the whole point of conversation conversation becomes all about the nose. So it's all that really. That's that's the sort of design approach really in a nutshell. Try and keep it as minimal as possible. And then, you know, Barry sculpted the aging maker. We ended up using the same nose that I sculpted on, mm. on the older version as well, because Meryl just preferred it to the one we made for the older one. She was comfortable with it and it did the job. So we used that. And then Barry did a really beautiful sculpture of of that character aged and then tried to inject as much of uh, Margaret Thatcher in it as, as we could, really. We were lucky. It just worked, you know. I remember the DOP saying to me, we had a meeting early on, you know, and I can't remember his name now. But he just turned to me and said, this could be a real career killer for you, couldn't it? <laughs> this is before I've done the job. It was like, oh, my God. And now you can turn around and go, uh, Oscar, BAFTA, yeah. <laughs> 
didn't kill anything. Thanks. <laughs> well, it was it was a bit terrifying at the time. It was like, oh my god, yes, it could that could have been the end of my career. That could have been like that that could have been my last job. You know, fortunately, it all went well. <laughs> yeah, it all went well. But I also have a funny feeling that Meryl Streep probably wouldn't let it go that way. Do you know what I mean? Like, she's not going to go on camera that's with something true. that that's she's We'd have been not happy with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, that's another nugget of information that, uh, that I got from Nick Dobbin, which is like, we're just here trying not to be fired. You know, that's what Nick <laughs> yeah. was saying. We're just here trying our best not to be fired. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It's <laughs> <laughs> You're waiting, but if you're lucky, it never comes. <laughs> yes, yes. So you just try, you were just working your hardest to try, try yeah. and uh, do you, do the best that you can, you know. Exactly. That's awesome. So that's a, a pretty amazing career moment is winning an Oscar and the BAFTA for yeah, that. Amazing. And then, yeah, I mean, incredible. So uh, is the BAFTA just far more exciting than an Oscar for you? Oh, no. I mean, they're both amazing and I'm really yeah. proud of both. But I think to win an Oscar is still in the UK. It's, it's still, still the height. Sort of, yeah, it's still the ultimate accolade, I think, for, for in our industry. I think so. Most yeah. people would say that, I think. Yeah. Just but curious. the best, you know, I mean, it's just really, you know, I'm really honoured to have won both. You know, and it's thanks to all the guys that are working for me, like, you know, Barry Gower and Stephen Murphy and all the mold makers and you know it's just a, a, a team effort you know oh you know, absolutely i end up yeah. getting the little gold statue but it you know it, it is down to the crew really that's what i've always tried to do just hire people that are better than me you know that's the that's the secret really of my success it's just hire the best that you can possibly afford or that you get on with and try and keep a you know make a happy team you know people who like working with each other and like-minded people who want to make the best things that they can possibly make, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, then you go on to win another Oscar and BAFTA for Wes Anderson's The Grand Budapest Hotel. And I have to say, I I still remember vividly in the theatre watching that. And when Tilda Swinton came up with that ageing, I was blown away. I was sitting there oh, like, nice. holy shit, she looks good. <laughs> and I think it was like the first time for me not being a, you know, I'm not following makeups and incredibly passionate about it, but just seeing it and just being like, oh, my God, I haven't seen I haven't seen anything that, I don't know, it just excited me. I was just like, that is so cool. So I was very happy to see that you guys ended up winning for that as well. Awesome. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was amazing. I mean, I, I think, you know, obviously I've got a credit here, you know, a few other guys, you know, like obviously Francis Hanu was the makeup designer on that, course, you know, yeah. all, all, all that beautiful wig work, mm. with, with, you know, the stuff that we spoke about with Fran, all the little, you know, things that went on in that makeup that me and Fran talked about. And then, you know, Duncan Jarman, who sculpted it, and Duncan yeah. was nominated for uh, The Revenant a few years later or the year after oh, or something. Yes, I don't know, cool. a few years later. But Duncan's brilliant and he sculpted the the makeup. You know, I, you know, I do my usual wander around and point here and there and say, can you change this or can you do that? Or, you know, I've always I'll, I'll let, let sculptors, you know, I give them a lot of freedom. I'm also in there. They'll, they'll probably tell you that I'm like really finicky and fussy. And so, you know, Duncan's involvement. And then Steve Murphy, who has worked with me for years and years on all the mm. Harry Potter films and doing Voldemort and all sorts of stuff that I've yeah. done since then, you know, and he's a super talented makeup artist. And the three of us sticking that makeup on together, you know, and Julie Darnell working on it as well. There's a lot of elements in there. You realize that these things are all a combination of all different people's skills that all come together on on, Absolutely. One, on one canvas, you know. So it's like, yeah. it's hard when I end up taking credit for these things that, you know, are, are really a, a massive team effort, you know. So And, and you know, Fran's work on the rest of the film, you know, that's why it won, I think. It's just got a really broad range of characters and each character, it's a period film, but it's not like, got the word period stamped all over it you know no it's got that Wes Anderson kind of magic thrown in there doesn't it so it's yeah um, that old age makeup that old age makeup on Tilda is a real sort of it's almost a caricature but we wanted to it's just a a larger than life character you know so that you know Wes Wes's involvement in adding more liver spots like more 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 when we were doing it was like oh my god there's so many liver spots on it it's like yeah like can we get away with this yeah 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 and then the lipstick was put on and 
the lipstick was put on and Tilda was like, oh, you know, I think it was her grandma or someone used to put yeah. her lipstick on really wobbly. So uh -huh. she wanted to put her own lipstick on and put it on badly. Uh, so yep. that was another little thing. And I'd done all the old age stipple around Tilda's eyes so because I decided, even though she was like, 90 or something i said to the guys i don't want to i don't want to put any pieces around their eyes i just want to use old edge stipples so i did a load of tests i i hired a an extra just from one of my extra catalog books and i around about the same age as tilda at the time and and got her in and did a lot of testing with various you know old edge stipple products around eyes and worked all that out you know and then we did a test maker but you, you know it was all little things like that really Every, everyone's got their own little input into it you know duncan sculpted it you know i interjected some stuff i did the old edge stipple bits you know fran did the wig you know there's julie's in there and you know steve murphy who's a genius at painting liver spots you know it's all these little elements that all come together in one makeup that, that made it work really well absolutely i think most people who work in the industry understand that it's never the one person who's done it all so <laughs> Yes, it's okay. but... <laughs> we know it's a team effort <laughs> and it's awesome that you're saying so because you know some people don't they're like yes I did this and I did that and I did everything and it's like no you didn't <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we all know I remember saying, a... back in the day when I went for my first when I was talking about earlier and I remember mm. saying to Dave oh, who sculpted that did Bob sculpt that no no <laughs> no <laughs> and it was like you know it was a bit of an eye opener it's like oh right okay you know you do tend to think that there's one person who does everything you know yeah nope always a nope. team when you were saying before about people not noticing or being able to figure out quite what's going on with the makeup i have to say that when i did a little research on your stan and ollie stuff i didn't realize you'd put like the little tips of the ears on and the chin oh this is on uh this is steve coogan yeah for yes, the, um, for the Stan Laurel makeup. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, we had yeah little change the ears because uh, you know Stan Laurel's ears stuck out just a little bit more than Steve Coogan's do, and yeah, we originally had a nose in there as well, which mm -hmm. kind of made him look a bit more like Stan Laurel, but sort of one of those things where you've got to trust your actor as well. You know, we do a makeup test and we think, oh yeah, the nose looks great. Really in profile, it really made him look more like uh, Stan Laurel, but. Steve Coogan, who's absolutely right, just said, I, I don't think I need the nose, you know. I mean, right. You know, and I, I thought, well, he, he he could play Stan Laurel without anything on, you know, mm. really. So, But one thing I really noticed Stan Laurel and all the footage that I looked for reference was that he's got this big flat chin that makes him look, mm. when he does that gormless look, it makes him look really gormless, you know, and he does that smile, yeah. you know. And I thought that would be one thing that would really enhance the look and the ears. The ears are a subtle thing that, that just add a little bit of detail in there, but they are yeah. quite indicative of, of Sam Laurel as well. So, yeah. And uh, Jeremy Woodhead, uh, makeup designer on that, he applied that every day. So, yeah, we did, I, myself and Josh Weston did the, the Oliver Hardy character. And again, that yeah. was great because John C. Riley. as soon as they said, John C. Riley was playing Oliver Hardy. I could just see it. You know, he's got the same shaped nose. He's he's got a wide face, so he can take the weight. You know, without us having to do much to his forehead, and and he'll be absolutely brilliant. You know, That's it turns cool. out that they're both like huge Laurel and Hardy fans, of course, because they're both you know comedians, comedy actors, and yeah. they love comedy. You know, they're, they're Stan and Ollie are, are their. Uh, well, uh, Laurel and Hardy are their, their absolute idols, you know, so it was a great project to work on. Yeah, I mean, you have that collaborative situation going on when you're just like, the, these guys know these people who they're very familiar with, so that almost helps yeah, you out. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, when somebody rings up about a job, my first fear is like that they don't look anything like the person that they, they need to be mm. or you just don't think they're right for it or and that was one conversation where it's like all right who are playing these two guys and uh it was steve coogan and john c riley and it was like yes yeah, that's this perfect casting <laughs> yeah that'll work because uh, you know obviously steve coogan is a brilliant you know actor and he also can mimic you know really well not that his performance was mimicking but it's mm. but he he can do it and john c riley is just great big bold character you know so a very confident and the fact that one's English and one's American, you know, it was just, it was just perfect, really. Yeah. 
It was a great watch. I thoroughly enjoyed that film. Ah, good. Hey, now you have to tell me, with this um, Tilda Swinton playing an 86-year-old man in Suspiria, how did yeah. this all come about? <laughs> Whose idea was that? <laughs> it was amazing. This was uh, Luca Granino's idea, you know, I think okay. um, in in conversation with Tilda, you know, mm. and Lucas had several, you know, some convoluted ideas and interesting ideas about why, you know, going into sort of the triumvirate of witches, you know, Mother Suspirium and Mother Lacrimarum and all that stuff that are in Suspiria, mm-hmm. these three witches that control the witches' coven. And, you know, he wanted them all to be played by the same woman. So he's got, you know, Tilda Swinton, he's got Mother Marcus, the big fan, mm-hmm. you know, crazy makeup that we did on Tilda playing the head of the hierarchy of witches and then the then he he wanted this sort of clemper character also to be played by Tilda so it, it sort of mimicked this triumvirate of witches you know that was you know one of Luca's explanations and the other one was oh it'll be fun <laughs> <laughs> you're like extremely challenging but yes <laughs> yeah so i think uh, i think luca's ideas for it and tilda's ideas for it are, are on a real sort of level of art you know it's like it's like a almost like a performance art you know like tilda wanted to create this character you know that's nothing to do with her so mm. she created the actor lutz herbersdorf i think his name was mm-hmm. that, that they created to sort of she didn't want anyone to ever know and i, I thought that was brilliant you know i thought how great you know that that if if we could, although you'd want people to know, it would be great for them not to know. I'd always yeah. probably sort of secretly down the line that at some point we'd we'd quite like want people to <laughs> we'd want people to know. Yeah. Uh, You're on your deathbed would, and going, that secret. I wish it got out. <laughs> there was some part of me secret that would love the fact that that people and I, I do still love the fact that people have watched that film and mm. not. I mean, you know, because it was out in the papers and everything else, then obviously people are watching it and looking for it. And, mm. you know, then, I, you know, but but there are genuinely people, plenty of people who've watched it who told me that they had no idea it was Tilda, you know, in, in makeup, you know. So I think we, we, we were successful to some people. There's a few things that I think would, would have improved it a bit. But it was like, I think, you know, just the odd shot of there was... There was going to be one shot early on of, of the character shaving in the mirror and you'd oh. see him na- naked from the waist up and they were going to replicate, you know, they were going to put Tilda's in makeup, put her face on a, on a double and comp it in using visual effects. And right. I, just thought that would, that, I just thought that would sell it oh, beautifully, yeah. you know. It would just be one thing that the audience isn't even aware of. Mm. You just see this guy shaving in the mirror and it's just a man, you know. And they did it at the end of the movie so successfully. But I think, it, you know, it's a low-budget movie and I think, They just got rid of that shot just because it was deemed to be, you know, superfluous, you know. But for me, that would have really sold it a lot better. But hey, amazing. (laughs) What a challenge. Great, fun job. What a a great job. (laughs) Now, I have to ask also are you a Queen fan, Mark? Yes, I am. Oh, you are. So Bohemian Rhapsody being involved in that was like a kid in a candy store, was it? Oh, God, yes. I I can't (laughs) tell you how much of a Queen fan I am. I was in the Queen (laughs) fan club when I was like 12 years old. Oh, that's awesome. Used to get my little, you know, my little circular come from them, you know, little little magazine. Yeah. So a massive Queen fan had all their albums, saw them live. And so that was a dream job, you know, and Jan Sewell did that as well. And she rang me up about possibly working on it. it was like yes absolutely mm. whatever it is you know and then it even like they they didn't really have a budget to get us involved with the application of it on set mm. but you know i managed to get on there during the live aid so we did all the makeup tests on rami with jan myself and stephen murphy who's also a massive queen fan we, we went oh. and helped out on the live aid portion of it yeah another great job really good yeah that's awesome i yeah Never, when you were getting those being part of the fan club, would you think that you'd be part of a film about about I Queen know, and have the, have the band there, right? I mean, were they there? Yeah, well, Brian May was on set nearly every – well, he was on set every day. Yeah, it was That's amazing. Cool. You know, for me, yeah. was, he's just a legend, you know. He's like mm. one of my childhood heroes, you know. Him and Roger oh. Taylor, I, you know, I remember, like, you know, I'd have loved to have had an autograph of them when I was, like, 14 or 15, you know. So these are your real proper China, childhood heroes, you know. You have a few, I think, in your early years, you know. I'd like yeah. people like Clint Eastwood and Bruce Lee. And if you met any of those guys, you'd be like, wow, you know. And, uh, 
Queen, the rock band Queen were definitely in that in that league for me. That's very cool. So it's very, very cool to be on set and have Brian May wander over and have a quick chat by the monitor, just me and him. <laughs> like, like have a little 10, 15 minute chat, you know, I'm sort of, wow, I'm chatting to one of my childhood heroes. It's crazy. That's awesome. Hey, I wanted to go back to Pinocchio just for a moment and yeah. ask, just bringing a fairy tale to life like that, how... I mean, where do you start with something like that? And such an extensive makeup on a child too, right? I mean, how does yeah. that Oh, ter- yeah, terrifying. <laughs> you know, like even after doing this job for 30 years, it's still like, you know, when you're asked about a job like that, it's like, oh, you know, can, can we do this? You know, can we do it on a small child for mm. that many days? I think we did 60 days nearly, over 50 applications okay. on Federico. How and, old is he? You know, he's, he was... 10, I think, at the time. Wow. Yeah. So he's only a couple of years older than my son is, you know, and I, there's no way that my son would be able to do that. <laughs> he's a little powerhouse, though. Federico is amazing. He's a proper yeah. little actor, you know, just at that age. It is phenomenal. I, I was so impressed by him, you know, and his ability to be able to do it, perform, and tough gig, you know, for a, even a seasoned actor, it would be a tough gig, you know. But the director, Matteo Garoni, had a lot of faith in him. And we just have to, you have to trust the person at the helm, really, don't you? You know, and design wise, it was a phenomenal job to do, you know, and so it's so close to his heart, Pinocchio. Mm-hmm. He storyboarded it when he was about 12, I think. So it's oh, something wow. that he's wanted to make for a long, long time. Mm. Um, so it was a great, great thing. You know, somebody else was going to be doing it a few years before. Nick Dublin was going to be doing it at one point. And somehow it came down and I ended up getting it. Um, and it came on the back of doing Suspiria, I think. So it was like, okay, okay. we've done a horror movie. But, you know, it's always the thing, like when, when someone rings up, it's like, what, what job's next, you know? And what have I not done that's going to be really challenging and interesting? Yeah. You know, Pinocchio with all this, brilliant characters on it was was a perfect really it was just like and there's some beautiful drawings done by a guy called pietro discola uh, okay. italian designer that matteo loves and ha- had him do uh, a lot of designs because it had been kicking around for 18 months or two years or so in the design phase oh. so there were a lot of drawings that had already been done you know so just you know matteo sent me a bunch of these drawings and it was like wow these are great yes we can oh. do this you know these would be brilliant the gorilla judge and the yeah yeah Raven doctor yeah it's amazing so so you get these these designs and sketches and stuff and then once people are cast then you're just kind of trying to put those two things together well, we, we started off, I had a sculptor working for me called Sebastian Lockman, and he's a really brilliant sculptor. He did a bunch of maquettes based on the drawings, really, and some of the drawings that we had done as well. And then okay. we did a bit of playing around. It was definitely a job where you had to sort of play around to get into Matteo's design ethos, you know, his right. thoughts and theories about the cat and the fox, for example. And Matteo's like, you know, he, he with all with directors, you just have to kind of mine into their brains and see, you know, pull out bits of nuggets of information and try and design your characters to their brief, you know, because they're, they're the boss ultimately. And, you know, however much you can input as much of your design ethos as possible, you still have to find out what it is that makes them tick. You know, so we looked at a lot of early drawings by Chi and, you know, the old traditional Pinocchio drawings. And, you know, you can see that in quite a few of the characters. And when you look at some of those drawings, there's little bits that we pulled out of everything. The hard bit about the whole film was getting Pinocchio, really, the actual character, because we didn't have the performer, you know. So Sebastian had sculpted an early version of Pinocchio, which looks nothing like the, the finished version and was based on a little girl called Alida, the girl who played the turquoise fairy, the fairy, okay. the younger one. She was going to play Pinocchio initially. And so we'd done a lot of designs on that. Matteo had loved them, but it wasn't going to be her ultimately. So when Federico was chosen, we mm-hmm. had to redesign everything from scratch. Really. Oh, wow. There were several things that were difficult about that. One is like, how do we make silicon look like wood? Can we paint it and make it really look like wood? Or I mm-hmm. really didn't want it to look like painted prosthetic painted like wood you know i just didn't want it to look like that yeah. we did a 
months of painting in all sorts of it's very easy to sort of take a piece of and paint a wood grain on it and it looks like wood but it doesn't really you know that's the thing mm-hmm. we were trying to really make it look like wood which is we realized it was down to sculpting and oh it was a torturous process you know, six months of you know a hone just the like, length of the nose and the size of it and the width of it and the you know we'd sculpt it and then send the pictures to Matteo and then the illustrator would change the hairline a little bit it would send back to us we'd readjust the hairline then it would go back and it just went back and forth every day for months it, w- it was torture but i think ultimately the torture was worth it you know because we got something that i think we were all happy with at the end of the day you've got this the limits of what you can do because you've got this space underneath there you know you can't you've got a sculpt on federico we have his eye shape and everything else we couldn't do we haven't got a free hand completely. So no. you're, you're forced into making it look somewhat how it, how it looks. But I think it works. I thought his, his character is cute, appealing, mischievous, and, you know, he, you feel for him. And that's the main main things, really, that, that you're trying to hit. But you're trying to create this makeup that also will move, you know, so it's got none of the, the sort of, you know, facial structure. That, so we were like, is it going to look... Is it going to look inanimate or is he going to be able to emote through it and, you know, be sad when he wants to be sad and happy when he wants to be happy? You know, so that was another thing to try and overcome. And then how do you get it on quickly? How do you get it on in two hours or two and a half hours or something? You know, how do you break it down to make it look real? And, yeah, it was, it was tough. So many elements. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mm. you know what I really loved was his earlobes. Oh yeah, the little wooden earlobes. <laughs> I don't know why, I just thought they were super cute. Little little wooden ears. Yeah, it was like uh, you know, do we make those wooden ears like the sculptor has, has added them on or are they carved out of the the whole piece? There's a huge discussion about that, you know. How do we, mm. you know, is, is the, are these added on? So we just did it how, we had a, the, the sculptor called Bruno Walpole, mm. who does a lot of these beautiful wooden heads and they're quite carved around some areas. They're a, they're a, bit, a bit like a wooden version of a Rodin okay. sculpture, you know, where parts of it are rough and hewn out of wood and the other parts are really beautiful and perfectly honed and so you'd have this yeah. gorgeous looking perfect skin uh, and then you know carved wooden shoulders you know and so if you bruno walpole and um, so we use a lot of his technique and uh, style on the the look of it that's very cool hey now mark where mm-hmm. you are in your career now and all that you've experienced and accomplished do you think it's been anything like you thought it was going to be when you were like 12 or 13 and thought, I want to make monsters? Oh, wow. That's a good question. <laughs> I think you yeah. have an idea of what it's going to be like, don't you? But then, of course, you live it and you're like, oh. I think, I think since running my own company, it's a, it's a sort of a mix of emotions, really, because I think my favorite time in the entire industry is when I first started out and I was learning everything, you know, Image animation, we were just, there was no expect, no massive expectations. You, you're just, you know, you've got a lump of clay and a life cast and you've got to make some kind of character, but you're not doing the lead character. You're doing some background zombie or something, you know. And then the more you progress through, the more pressure there is on you to create something good and the more expectation there is and the less enjoyable it becomes to some degree. But then there's the reward of making stuff that's really nice compensates for that, you know, or winning an award or, you know, the nice things that go with it. You know, there's a lot of pain and struggle along there. I, you know, I have the utmost admiration to anybody who runs a makeup company or is a makeup designer. You know, the, the makeup designers, their life is full on, you know, when you're shooting a movie, you know, being a makeup designer or hair designer, you know more so even than, than our side of things, really, I think. A lot of the time we're in the workshop and we don't have to deal with actors and directors and, and then we go on set when, when our stuff is needed. So on most projects, we're not in there full on every day, you know. But I, I would have had no idea at that time, you know, even at 18, 19, you know, I would have had no mm-hmm. idea of what the job would become, you know. Now I'm sat doing spreadsheets and budgets and organizing <laughs> And, yeah. you know, making sure the heater's working in my workshop and making sure the bins get empty. You know, all the really tedious chores, the floor needs painting or the, you know, the internet's gone down. So you've got to ring the 
telephone company and all the rubbish that you have to deal with <laughs> running a company. I would have had no idea about that. No, I mean, back when it was you guys at the beginning, it was all very rock and roll, wasn't it, it sounds like? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> somebody, somebody else did all that rubbish. You know, we just <laughs> we just sculpted and painted things, you know, which is why I think now there are some guys in the UK and I'm sure there are in America too that, and all over the world where they just want to work they don't want to run a company, you know. Not not everybody who comes in through my workshop wants to set up their own company. You know, it's it's, it's quite a big deal to do it, and it's quite an undertaking, you know. Somebody said to me, I think years ago, and I can't remember who it was or when. Mm. They said, "Oh, it takes about sixteen years," and they were quite specific. It takes about yeah. sixteen years before you you, you can run your company and actually you know, be on that list of companies that people ring you know, regularly mm. enough to get work. And I think they were they were right. It was a real struggle for a long time. Yeah. Well, it's such a balance. I mean, how do you, you're just kind of having to divide yourself up into all these different areas. I mean, you're an artist, firstly, surely, and now you have to deal with business stuff. And as you say, spreadsheets and managing people and being on set and then off set designing. And it's, I mean, how do you, how do, you do all that? Yeah, it is, it is tough and it's a real battle with me because I really would prefer to just be doing the art stuff and have somebody else deal with all that other stuff. Mm. But, you know, there are, you know, like on this low budget vampire film we've just done, there are things that, that are just like, oh God, I'm going to have to go and do that because nobody else is going to want to go and do it. You know, stand on a film set squirting blood and being responsible for cutting somebody's throat and squirting blood in the right way and it's really stressful and you know you turn around to the guys and it's like oh god he's not going to want to do it and they're not going to want to do it so i'm going to have to do it so I, a lot of the time i end up doing the rubbish jobs that nobody wants to go and do you know or if there's a makeup that has to be stuck on 40 times that you know i'll, I'll end up doing that you know these days i, I like you know on pinocchio for example I, I did about 15 days on on federico with Robin Pritchard and and then mm -hmm. we we handed it around and you know we rotated so Anna Kisa did a bit with Robin and we rotated around a little bit because I had too much other stuff to deal with you know but I always like to be in there painting or I try and sculpt something at some point you know but quite often I don't get time or chance and it's very hard to sculpt something when there's other things going whirling around in your head like yeah. you know, oh I need to order the eyes for this and the hair for that beard and you know, you can't, you've got to sculpt something and be good at it. You've got to sit down and focus on it for a long period of time. Yeah, I got to stay on task and not get um, distracted. Yeah, that's right. So I tend to sculpt the things that can be knocked out pretty quickly and that I've done before, like if a bald cap, uh, I need to do a bald cap on somebody or I need to do eyebrow blockers or I need to do a mm. neck wound or a throat appliance or a nose for this or a nose for that. I'll, I can do all that stuff, you know and leave the full old edge makeups and the, the you know, involved characters to somebody who can actually sit there and spend the time on it properly. It's a bit sad, really. I, you know, I, I, I remember talking to Rick about it, Rick Baker, and, mm -hmm. you know, seven times Oscar-winning world champion, you know, and <laughs> I got a very similar feeling, although I'm not saying that I'm in anywhere near the, the scale of Rick. He's had a massive shot, but we had the same kind of thoughts about, God, the, you know, the longer you have a company, the, the more you get stuck behind the desk and, uh, and the less chance you have to get out there and do the artwork, you know. And I think it, it happens to all of us. Every every time I talk to somebody, when you think, God, if it happens to Rick, then, you know, surely he's got the ability to be able to control all that stuff and hire yeah. whoever he wants. But Rick had the same problems of trying to keep the same crews and when there's n no work, that hiatus for a few weeks, you, you've mm -hmm. still got to pay them. Otherwise, they're off to Stan Winston's or somewhere else, you know, and uh, we have the same now, you know, it's very hard to keep hold of the same people. We all want to keep the same people and, you know, keep this core crew, especially when you find people you work really well with. But it is quite difficult. It's part of the, the chore of running a company, really. But, you know, the, the positives far outweigh the negatives, for sure. Well, yeah. Otherwise, you wouldn't be still doing it, right? Yeah, I'd be working for other people. I think. I think in my in my in my situation, I just got to a point where I'd worked for pretty much every company that was around, and I worked for Nick, and I loved working for Nick Dubbin on the Harry Potter films. But mm. I just wanted something a bit more. I just wanted a little bit more control over the design of some of the characters and I thought the only way I'm going to get that is to do my own stuff you know where you can say okay this is the way that I want this done and that's the the main 
thing about running your own company, you just you can put your stamp on it. You can hire if you lo- love a particular sculptor or a particular painter, you can hire those guys if you can. Mm. And and even then, you're putting your stamp on it because you're hiring the, those people and putting them together. So the thing will look how you want it to look, you know, with their interjection, of course. But, yeah. but you know that that's the design the part of it, isn't it? That's very cool. So. What one tool or product, Mark, would you never want to be without? If you had all your stuff set up, well, this is a tricky question for you, I think, because you do work in the workshop, but also on set. So, oh, blimey, are you talking about? You know, I mean, you know, I couldn't live without my yeah. MacBook Pro laptop, for example. Yeah, you know, so that would be it. My MacBook Pro laptop, I think. Yeah. And then the other one would be clay. <laughs> okay. We can't do anything. We can't do anything without clay. But in terms of makeup kits. Mm -hmm. I think skin illustrators, really, Premier Products skin illustrators, they're just like, they're brilliant. And I've just had them in my kit, you know, and real color. Those those, those tattoo inks have just changed Mm -hmm. the way that we paint. You know, we use them all the time now and they sound really well. And, you know, we had a, we did a test makeup last week and, you know, a, a full, full makeup, prosthetic makeup and mm. a white shirt. And we didn't get any makeup on the white shirt, you know. And it used to be before the days of tattoo makeups, you were using Pax paint, yeah. which would rub off or stick to your mm-hmm. white shirt. And, and this was great. You know, you could just use your skin illustrators and have a nice clean white shirt still at the end of the day, you know. I mean, glues, I think you can use all sorts of glues. So it's not, mm-hmm. not really one glue. And you've always had glues, you know, they were sticking makeups on Charles Lawton, uh, you know, in the 30s, with, you know, so I, I don't think, you know, glue is not so no. so revolutionary, you know, but, but skin illustrated, tattooing. Yeah. Know. So out of those palettes, do you have a favorite? Yes, I am definitely the original skin illustrated palette. And there's only about four that I use. I use the dark, the original skin illustrator, the effects one. Mm-hmm. And compl- and the complexion one because there's yes. so many palettes out there now. You'd have to have mm. about 60, 60 palettes open on your table, you know. <laughs> yeah. Like I need to, yeah, I need to. Uh, I, I always think, oh, I'm, I'm going to get my own palette together with all the colours and uh, all the ones that I use and make a, another palette up. And but thing is, every job, you know, you look at your makeup kits these days. Yeah. And, you know, I look at those makeup kits that the the you know the guys back in the 60s 50s and 60s had and it's a little wooden Gerstner yeah. box you know with a few pancake makeups in it now yeah. my my makeup kit like fits in the back of a lorry you know it's just like <laughs> every, every job we go on it's like god there's my hair kit in six boxes and there's my you know, airbrush stuff i've got about eight airbrushes and i've got about 70 palettes like you've got to you've got to just pick and choose what you're going to use for that particular job haven't you really the makeup kit yeah. is these days. i know my my hair kit's the same it's ridiculous i keep thinking that at some point i'm going to really consciously narrow down my products to have just a core group of products and not stray outside of those products yeah. <laughs> that I just have you know what i did work. i did a job years ago the highlander 2 job that we talked about earlier and where i met i met the the legend greg cannon yeah. And, you know, Greg was just a huge hero of mine at the time. And, you know, we got that he was doing Christophe Lombard's aging makeup, which was brilliant. It was beautiful. And, and we got on really well with Greg and we ended up going out for dinner with him, hung out on set with him a lot, myself and Paul Jones. And I remember asking him if we could come and watch the makeup, him sticking the makeup on. He very graciously let us let mm-hmm. me stand in the corner. He just said, stand in the corner and don't say a word. And, you know, so I did. <laughs> and, uh, I just watched him stick the makeup on it. And the great thing about Greg was, you know, looking at his makeup desk and it was like, he's got about six pots on there. There were four pots of Pax paint, one mm-hmm. of latex, one of glue, one of remover mm-hmm. and very little else, you know, and about 10 brushes. And he'd go on set with a little plastic carrier bag he didn't even have a makeup bag. And I just thought, wow, that's amazing. He's doing this beautiful makeup with the minimal products. You know, he knows exactly what he needs. Yep. And I, I aspire to that, but I'm nowhere near. I just, I'm <laughs> terrible. When I'm packing my kit up, it's like if I'm driving there and I've got mm. a van, yeah. I'll fill my van with everything. <laughs> just Right. I, I, just I've got everything case. here. And I'll still forget something. I'll still go, oh, have you got any? Uh, I'll still be there with my, oh, where's my anti-shine? Oh, I forgot. I yeah. forgot to pack it. You know, I've now got my makeup list, which is about 20 pages long. That I, I highlight everything that I'm going to need. I go through the makeup, think, okay, here, this is everything I'm going to need. And then I yeah. cross it off when it's actually gone in the bag. 
in the box, you know, just to make sure I don't forget anything. Cause Very organised. So like, oh, man, I have to do it. I have to do it. I feel like that's a little bit of a comfort thing for you to make sure you've got everything that you could possibly need. Well, I, I don't think I could, you know, you're getting on an aeroplane and you're going oh, yeah. to do a, no, make, a makeup on a famous, <laughs> a famous actor, you know this. Yeah. You, you, the, you can't let someone else pack your kit because what if they forget and then you can't sleep at night because you think, mm. have they remembered? put this in and have they remembered to put that in so whenever i've got someone else to pack my kit for me i've, I've been there texting them going but you know at midnight going oh did you remember hair clips did you put in you know did you put in yeah you know yeah it, it's like so i always like to pack my own kit and i know it's in there or i've only got myself to blame if i forget it yeah exactly that's amazing <laughs> so now what one person would you like to hear on the podcast Ooh, a person I'd like to hear on the podcast. Blimey. Yes, that would be, well, I go, what I'd really like to hear is oh. Rob Botine because he's never done. <laughs> this dude is like. <laughs> I doubt he's got much chance of getting Rob. <laughs> I tell you what, how, how many people have said, said that name and I'm just like, there's no chance in hell. That's never, yeah, never going to no, be, It would be I, great though because, you know, we've heard, we've heard from all the other guys many times over the years, but not much, yeah. not much from Rob, you know. Okay, like I would like to, I'd love to hear one with Arian Tweeten. I don't know if you've done Arian. No. Arian, okay, he runs his company r.e.n and he's a brilliantly talented makeup artist he used to work for uh, sam winston and then rick baker and was one of rick's main guys uh, for years okay. and now does his own stuff i'd love to hear from over on this side of the pond in the uk barry gower or duncan jarman or josh weston or stephen murphy any of those guys would be super entertaining awesome yeah they're all super talented I'm sure there's so many, so many of you out there. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, I will tell you what. There's some really brilliant guys in Europe that, that, like my unsung heroes. I think you know the guys that do this really beautiful work, mm -hmm. and uh, nobody knows who they are, you know, or apart from guys in their own country, you know, like people like yeah. Fred Lenné and Jean Christophe Spadaccini and Denis Gastu, and you know, just there's so many. Uh, on World War Z, I was really lucky to be able to hire a bunch of those guys because we were mm -hmm. filming around, and before Brexit. God forbid, we were allowed to hire, or you know, anyone from Europe, you know, without any trouble or visas or anything like that. And yeah. I was lucky enough to get a bunch of them over on World War Z doing day-to-day uh, -day application, you know, and it was great. It was so amazing. So so many talented Europeans, you know, working on that that one project, you know, it was really fab. And that's I'm still amazing. friends with a lot of them now, you know, so it was a really good fun project. Well, I think that's what happens on film sets, isn't it? You you make a little family and you kind of, those connections are strong. Yeah, I miss the, I miss the Makeup Artist trade show over in the UK, which is the one time in the year that we can sort of all get together and see all those people. But because of this uh, pandemic thing, it's, you know, it's not been around for, yeah, I'll be looking forward to that coming back on, on the scene. Well, Mark, thank you so much. It's been great to finally chat with you. No, thank you. It's been my pleasure. Awesome. For links to see more about our guests, go to our Instagram at The Last Looks Podcast or our website, thelastlookspodcast.com. If you want to keep up with new episodes being released, be sure to subscribe through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, Google Play, YouTube, or any podcast streaming platform. And remember, if you're enjoying the show, share it. The Last Looks Podcast would like to thank Brett Stanley and Sabrina Castro. The song Fun Time by DJ Quads. Thanks for listening. Until next time. That's a wrap, people.